Starting off at number 10, we have the Javan tiger. This tiger subspecies was native to the Indonesian island of Java. It was a lot smaller than its Asian cousins on the mainland. Now, despite this, they were no less scary to the local people there who would respectfully call them Mr. Tiger in case one of them was ever listening. As the human population there swelled in the early 20th century, the Javan tiger retreated to the mountains where they preyed on deer and wild boar. That's where the last ones were sighted in 1976, and despite huge searches for them, since then, it's thought they went extinct not long after. Kicking off the list at number 10, passenger pigeons. Commonly confused with the morning dove, the passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. They're quite similar to the pigeons that we see every day in the city, only instead of being aggressive and you know covered in mayonnaise, they were graceful, dare I say. They were beautiful. Billions of these bright orange birds would paint the skies, and rumor has it, they would fly in flocks so large it would block out the sun for about an hour or a long period of time. Flocks that block, how incredible is that? But only a few decades passed and passenger pigeons are no more. What happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon was Martha. Yeah, Martha passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914, so we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to their extinction. They discovered that Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. It's our growing population, guys. It's because we wanted to, you know, now we can't have any Marthas. Natural selection and hunting eliminated arguably the coolest looking bird out there. Hashtag save Martha. Keeping off the list at number 10, the golden toad. The disappearance of the golden toad is the first extinction in history to be blamed on man-made global warming. Good job, guys. What better way to kick off this eye-opening part two? The golden toad extinction event happened pretty recently and pretty quickly. In their home of Costa Rica, it was considered a good omen, or it was lucky if you saw it. I mean, obviously, it's a golden toad. If this was Super Mario, that would for sure be a star. You know, it catches the eye, it's beautiful. But then sightings became more and more rare come 1987. It was no question these little dudes were disappearing. Not just golden toads either. Nearly half of all frogs and toads within a 30 kilometer radius Yes, we're dying off. Thing is, there weren't any humans around here either. People weren't scooping up golden toads and like taking them back. The area was free from human interaction, which tipped scientists off. Now we can conclude that the cause was for sure climate change. See, as it got warmer and warmer, the frogs became more susceptible to the chytrid fungus, which was already destroying frog populations worldwide. And we, of course, just didn't help. Sorry, golden frogs. First up at number 10, we have the passenger pigeon. Now, these wild birds lived in huge numbers in North America. When Europeans arrived, there was thought to be about 4 billion passenger pigeons on the continent. Now, to put that in perspective, there was about 500 million humans alive at the time. That meant these pigeons out outnumbered humans about eight to one. What? They would swarm in the air in groups of about a mile wide, and people said it actually took hours for a flock to pass overhead. But they lived in forests that the settlers chopped down for farmland. When they tried to eat the grain from this new farmland, the hunt was on. There were no laws about how many pigeons a farmer could kill, and the killing during the 19th century was crazy. It was just a slaughter. By the time conservation laws came in, it was already way too late. Martha, the last passenger pigeon in existence, died in a zoo in 1914. That one is just depressing. Coming in at number 10, we have Homo heidelbergensis, also known as Heidelberg Man. This extinct human ancestor walked the earth about 600,000 years ago in Africa, parts of Asia, and Europe. They are believed to be the direct ancestors of Neanderthals, and some archaeologists even argue that they are archaic or early Neanderthals. Heidelberg Man was an exceptionally tall, ancient man. They hunted and butchered large prey, and may be the first species of Homo to intentionally bury their dead. I wonder what those funerals must have been like. It was like Glue Perp was a very fast runner, but he wasn't so fast that he didn't get mauled by a saber-toothed tiger. And now let's move on before the same thing happens to all of us. Coming in at number 10, we have Homo guntingensis. We are starting off with an ancestor that might have had a smaller brain than most of our other predecessors, but it seemed that this creature was quite resourceful. Homo guntingensis was a species that seemed to have the ability to use fire. It's unknown how it learned this skill. Maybe it was passed down from generation to generation, like 
we do with driving or watching American Idol. The way that scientists are able to make this assumption is from charred bones that were found along with the fossils of Homo gontingensis. This means that this prehistoric man was cooking its meat before it ate it. Imagine you were the first guy to cook food, you bring a girl over for a date and you're like, hey, you want some charred meat? You are for sure getting a second date. However, it seems from this ancestor's teeth that meat wasn't often on the menu. They had large flat teeth which are commonly associated with herbivores. It also seemed that Homo gontingensis lived mostly in trees and might have come down occasionally to hunt or forage for food, but outside of that, trees are where this creature loved to live. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Stellar Sea Cow. Stellar indeed! Okay, the Stellar Sea Cow was named after George Wilhelm Steller, who discovered this massive creature in 1741 during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition. They found her right after the crew became shipwrecked. What a lovely surprise to an otherwise horrible situation. They were around over 2.6 million years ago, and they were no match for humans. They only swam about a meter deep, and once humans came into the picture with, you know, hunting and aggression and everything, they were quite easy to hunt. George Steller commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which in turn made it even easier for us to hunt them. Considering the one year gestation period, the species just couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with our hunting. But this list, we have a little hope now, don't we? Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we could see the creature again one day. Hopefully. The answer may lie right now in the DNA of a dugong. Dugongs are the cow of the sea. You know what, they're great. Let's have all the cows of all seas back immediately. Starting off this countdown, we have the California condor. The California condor is the largest vulture and land bird in North America. From tip to tip, its wings stretch about 10 feet. It's got a big wingspan. They also can fly as high as 15,000 feet in the air. Now these vultures used to live all throughout the southwestern US into northwestern Mexico. But during the 20th century, their population started to decline due to pesticides, poaching, and loss of habitat. By 1987, there were so few left that scientists declared them extinct. During that time, there were only about 27 or less in the wild. But don't worry, the US government actually helped save these animals. They created a captive breeding program and set it up in a number of zoos across the country. This program is said to be one of the most expensive conservation projects in US history. It cost about $35 million and $2 million per year to keep it up. And slowly but surely, they helped increase the amount of condors. As of 2019, their population is at 118. Some of the birds have even been reintroduced into the wild. They are still at risk, but all the birds are tagged and the US are keeping a close eye on them to make sure they never get near extinction ever again. Number 10, the dodo. In the words of my roommate, dodo. Classic. Perhaps one of the most infamous extinctions known to man was that of the dodo bird. When humans met the dodo bird, they were literally eaten to death within 80 years, I think, of their discovery. They were easy to catch, and as their name suggests, they weren't they weren't the smartest. But guys, there are some really exciting things happening in the world of genetics and finally, scientists are on the way to bringing them back. After collecting various DNA samples in January 2016, the University of California announced that they have completed the genome sequence of the dodo bird, opening a variety of doors. With this new information, scientists may be able to recover enough DNA to create a clone to implant in the eggs of the closely related modern pigeon. Now though, for our number 9, it's the Caribbean Monk Seal. As the name suggests, this Monk Seal was found in the Caribbean, unlike its relatives that you usually find in much colder climates. As with the passenger pigeon, contact with European settlers during the 17th century spelled doom for this Monk Seal. They were hunted for their oils and also because they were competition for fishermen. One of the problems was they just weren't scared of humans at all. They never tried to run because they never had a reason to throughout the course of their evolution. Now all of these facts has led to the point where the last one was spotted in 1952, and scientists think they were totally extinct by 1960. Seven years later, the animal was placed on the endangered species list. Um, yeah, I, th I think you're a little bit too late for that. Number nine, the smooth hand fish. Not to be confused with Cool Hand Luke, the smooth hand fish was the first time in modern history where a marine type fish went extinct. How? Okay. This fish was a shallow water bottom dweller and I personally love him because he looks so angry all the time. He looks like one of Bowser's minions. He looks like he's in a terrible mood. He has a horn that protrudes 
out of his face, so honestly, I don't blame him, TBH. Just 200 years ago, you would have seen these smooth dudes in the land down under. They lived in Australia, in Tasmania's warm waters, and what made this fish so unique, as its name hints towards, is its hands. Not its jazz hands, but its smooth hands. He has some little smooth hands. The smooth hand fish would seemingly walk along the ocean floor. It uses its fins as hands. So an angry looking fish with a horn coming out of its face would walk towards you slowly underwater. That's not terrifying at all. Hard pass. Graham Edgar, marine ecologist at the University of Tasmania, shed some light on its habits, explaining that these fish were homebodies. They didn't have a large habitat. They spent most of their time sitting in the seabed with an occasional flap for a few meters if they're disturbed. Just an occasional at that point, they would just walk away with their hands, just away from the drama. And next up at number nine now, we have the sea mink. Have you guys ever heard of or seen in real life a real fur mink coat? They used to be very popular. The thing is, they were made from the fur of the sea mink. This creature was native to the coasts of Maine and New Brunswick. They were longer and bulkier than other mink species, which made their coats almost twice as big. Because of this, they were hunted to extinction somewhere between 1860 and 1870, meaning any mink mink coat you see made from a sea mink is going to be pretty old indeed. Number 9, Aurochs. The great 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 grandfather of our modern day cattle. These big boys were quite aggressive, but humans were of course way worse. Classic. Eurasian aurochs were these massive wild ox that walked gracefully through the lands of Europe, Asia, and Siberia. The average height for one of these guys was around six feet, but their horns made them appear much larger. See, because of these impressive horns, they were viewed as aggressive animals. So often in ancient Roman arenas, they were used for sport. So that surely didn't help. They're aggressive when locked inside a death arena. Wow, get out of town, really? You don't say. By the time the 13th century rolled around, the only humans allowed to hunt aurochs because their number was so low were royals and nobles. This animal is endangered, unless you're rich, I guess. Come 1564, there were only 38 left, and 1627 marks the last time one was seen alive. She died in Poland due to natural causes. It wasn't, you know, warriors this time around. Number nine, passenger pigeons. The passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies. They would fly in flocks so large, it would block out the sun for a short amount of time. Isn't that beautiful? It's like some Lion King stuff right there. But only a few decades passed and passenger pigeons are now no more. So what happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her extinction. They discovered discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting obviously just eliminated the coolest looking bird out there by far. A little different than the pigeons we have today, that's for sure. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon protected in indigenous lands in Canada, up in Northwest Territories. They blended passenger pigeon DNA with Archaeopteryx dinosaur DNA. Yeah, we're bringing back pigeons with a hint of dinosaur. What could go wrong? At number nine, we have Homo rudolphinus. This extinct human ancestor is only known through a small number of fossil bone fragments. There have been some debate on whether or not Rudolphinus is the earliest known member of the Homo genius or is a very late member of the Australopithecus genius. Due to the scant nature of the remains, not much is known about the species, but evidence suggests that the brains were proportionately larger than the other earliest members of the Homo genius. These guys were huge eggheads. No wonder they didn't make it for a very long time. I don't think nerds would have fared well before laws were invented. Well, they did have laws back then. It was just who could punchy punch the bestie best. Coming in at number nine, we have Homo ergaster. Moving over to Africa, Africa now, there's a reason they call Africa the cradle of civilization. It seems that a lot of our ancestors have come from this place, and this is where a good chunk of Homo ergaster's remains were found. Homo ergaster was a transitional ancestor. It seemed to have a weaker bone structure compared to similar species. This would mean that Homo ergaster had started moving into a lifestyle that was less dominated by physical conflict. There's also a lot of evidence that showed Homo ergaster had a more advanced system of social interaction. I mean, they weren't sharing K-pop songs together, but they were gathering in large groups. Who knows what they could have been doing back then? I think it was probably beatbox battling. That's just my highly educated scientific opinion. You don't have to believe me, but I'm on part three of this series. So 
I think I would know. Number nine, the thylacine. The story of the last known thylacine or Tasmanian tiger is very sad. His name was Benjamin, and after thousands of his species were eradicated for fear that they'd eat Australia's cattle, he was the last one left. He was a resident in the Bomera Sioux in Hobart for a while, until one night, out of neglect, they didn't let him back into the kennel. He died of exposure, and his body was thrown into a dump. So sad. But Michael Archer believes we owe it to Benjamin to bring him back. There is one surviving sample of the thylacine that was pickled, pickled in alcohol. Unfortunately, some of the samples were contaminated by careless human DNA, so people reaching in going, ooh, look, it's so weird, and then dropping it back in. But the teeth contained viable samples. In fact, they were able to splice the thylacine cell successfully with a mouse. Archer even argues that should we be able to bring them back, that they could thrive in the Tasmanian ecosystem still, as not much has changed. As we will discover on this list, there's a lot we can do now when it comes to cloning, so it is only a matter of time before we see them again. In our ninth spot today, we have the Somali elephant true. Now don't be fooled, this isn't an elephant, but it does have a long pointed snout like an elephant. It's as small as a mouse and kind of looks like one too, but they aren't actually a shrew that rhymed. In fact, they are related to aardvarks, elephants, and manatees. You heard me correctly, these tiny little creatures are related to elephants and manatees. How? I, I, don't, I don't understand nature. Anyways, the last recorded sighting of this creature was in the 1970s. After that, scientists declared the species extinct. That was until August of 2020. A team of researchers were out doing studies when they came across these tiny little creatures. From there, they decided to try and see how many elephant shrews were left in the wild. So they set up more than 1,000 traps with a tasty treat of peanut butter, oatmeal, and yeast inside. In total, they came across 12 elephant shrews of the same species. Now, thousands of these little guys are back and are no longer threatened or in danger. Number eight, the great auk. Its name makes you think that this is the size of a moose or it's some type of ox, <laughs> when in fact, it's really just a cute flightless seabird. Look at it. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its tiny wings though, would only be used to swim. Little penguin flappy arms, no wonder they couldn't fly. Look at those things. They were cute and also quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out. Newfoundland literally looked like the iceberg in Club Penguin. It was packed, it was a great time, but that's how they rapidly declined. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Elde Island, just off the coast of Iceland. Way to go, dude. Coming in at number eight now, we have the Pyrenean Ibex, otherwise known as the Bacardo. Now these wild goats were once common among most of Spain and Portugal for thousands and thousands of years. At one point, there was thought to be about 50,000 of these majestic big horn creatures roaming around the hills and mountains there. Eventually, though, after hundreds of years of being hunted, and having to compete with domestic animals, the Pyrenean ibex numbers began to dwindle. Conservation efforts made by the Spanish government were too little too late. A management plan wasn't even made until 1993, when just 10 of the animals remained. Celia, the last wild Pyrenean ibex, was found dead on January the 6th, 2000, after she had been killed by a falling tree. The species was declared extinct. Now, scientists did manage to clone a female ibex in 2009, but it only lived for a few minutes. Okay, moving on now. To moving on to our number eight now, we have the great orc. This flightless bird lived in the colder parts of coastal Canada, Greenland, Iceland, and other European fringes. It might look a bit like a penguin, but it really wasn't. These things mated for life. They lived in dense colonies and laid just one single egg on a bare rock. They lived alongside humans for about 100,000 years, but by the early 20th century, their numbers were dwindling. In a cruel twist of fate, museums wanting to preserve their eggs for display only sped up their extinction, and the last one was seen in 1852. Number eight, Aleotra Gribe. Sounds like a Harry Potter spell, let's do it. These guys were a species of grape, which are aquatic diving birds, and they made their homes in the beautiful lakes around Madagascar. Throughout the 20th century, their population was rapidly declining because of habitat destruction as well as the introduction of the blotched snakehead, which then began to prey on them. First their homes were reduced, and then this bully of a fish swims in and starts taking names. 
double whammy, sorry guys. Their extinction was official come 2010, which is super recent when thinking about something like the dodo bird. Scientists were hesitant to officially classify them as extinct because of the fact that their home is so remote and tiny. They were hard to find. There were thorough surveys in the area in 1989, 2004, and 2009 that all failed to find any remaining evidence of the species. And on top of that, the last confirmed sighting was all the way back in 1982. If you're thinking maybe they flew away, mm, good idea, but think again. These guys had tiny wings, so traveling long distance was a no-go. It's believed they couldn't have found a home. Pretty sad, right? Well, hit that thumbs up and we'll do a part three to wash it all down. Number eight, the woolly mammoth. It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal are planning to bring back, are planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. That's just the thing we need right now in this world. Out of all the problems, we're like, you know what could solve it? The woolly mammoth, for sure. That'll bring jobs back. The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these woolly mammoths, but climate change began to slow them down just a little bit. And humans also needed food, so that surely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and, well, look at them, obviously, a lot of food. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. Honestly, I hope it works, but then, I mean, now what? All these things are great scientifically, but it's like, and then what? Next up at number eight is Java Man. This early human was actually made up of 80% coffee and that's how it got its name. And the reason it went extinct was because it was brewed to death. That's a stupid dad joke. And hopefully you didn't believe that because I just made that up. But this next part is true. In the early 1890s, the tooth and skull cap and thigh bone of an extinct human species were found by a team of archeologists in East Java. That's what gave this discovery the nickname Java Man. It was a big deal at the time as the bones at that point were the oldest known hominid ever discovered. It was originally argued by some archaeologists that Java Man was the ancestor of Homo erectus, but there were some who said that it was the so-called missing link between ape and man. Coming in at number 8 is Homo serpentensis. This extinct species is extremely interesting because there's so little known about it. Most of the time when a new species is discovered, there's a series of fossils that can be traced back to the same specimen. Sometimes there's even stone tools and evidence as to what their social system looked like. But with this guy, there's none of that. We don't have any any info of this old school dude because the only thing that we found was just one skull. It was discovered back in 1994 and since then there has been no discoveries that could be linked back to this guy. It's a lone ranger. Now how could a skull be found and there be nothing else? Well there's a good chance that this bad boy was killed by something and then the skull was taken to another place and then just chucked on the ground after whatever was carrying it was done with it. It's kind of brutal but back then skulls would have been ripped off of bodies all the time. It was the stone age baby. People ripped your head off as a prank. Moving on to number 8 we have the Bermuda Petrel. This is the second rarest seabird on the planet. In fact, it was last seen on Nonsuch Island in 1620. They literally thought it was extinct for over 300 years. They went extinct because their habitat was destroyed by sea erosion and hurricanes. But then in the 1950s, they were like, surprise, no, we're here, we're here to stay, we're just playing. So in the 1950s, their nest was spotted east of Bermuda with a few birds nearby. In 1951, 36 of these birds were rediscovered. And as of 2021, their population is increasing. The government created new nesting sites for these seabirds. And as of spring 2020, there are a total of 134 breeding pairs. We went from 18 to 134. Hell yeah. But according to conservation officer Jeremy Madrios, he said, and I quote, it's an ongoing recovery, an example for threatened species around the world in an era when encroachment on and destruction of habitats is putting more species at risk than ever before. Well spoken. Number eight, aurochs. You may have never heard of aurochs, but they are one of the most important creatures to have ever walked this earth. They are the great, great grandparents of all living cattle today. So I guess you better thank them for the burger you're barbecuing. Aurochs used to roam all across Europe and were responsible for managing biodiversity through grazing. However, this species was hunted to extinction in 1627, but its DNA still lives on. The Tauros program aims to bring back the aurochs as a functional wild animal by backbreeding its closest relatives. It may not be exactly the same, but they hope to genetically breed this cattle to the point that it resembles as closely as possible the original aurochs, kind of like a modern day equivalent. Number seven, the giant tortoise. 
When the Mayans said the world was going to end in 2012, honestly, they may have just been onto something. 2012 was also the year we lost the last Pina giant tortoise. His name was Lonesome George. He was by himself, as his name suggests. And for decades before his passing, scientists were trying to get him to... No, with females of a similar subspecies, but he just wasn't feeling it. Man was tired. I mean, look at him. The guy looks exhausted already. He looks like he needs three coffees before swiping right on mating apps. Lonesome George and his wrinkly necked friends weighed in at about 400 pounds, growing up to six feet long. They were massive. They were beautiful, big neck boys. Again, this extinction comes back to us humans, with the use of tortoises as an onboard food in the 19th century, and the goat population growing rapidly during the 60s and 70s, these tortoises were screwed. They ran out of food and they were just becoming food. Double whammy, double negative. At number seven, we've got the Tasmanian tiger. Now, despite looking like a cross between a tiger and a dog, this animal is not closely related to either of them. It actually belonged to the marsupial family, the one that includes the kangaroo, and like them, it carried its young in a pouch. There are actually cave paintings in Australia going back thousands of years ago with pictures of the Tasmanian tiger on the walls there, which I think is fascinating. But despite their presence there, their numbers slowly dwindled until they could only be found on the island of Tasmania. They started off being quite a rare sight there, but they soon began to hunt farmers' sheep, and the government then started offering rewards for every Tasmanian tiger that was killed. This relentless bounty hunting, along with the loss of habitat and new diseases that were introduced, meant that in 1933, the last confirmed Tasmanian tiger was captured and put in a zoo, where it lived for three years before dying from neglect. That's ugh, awful. Now, there have been a couple of reports out there of wild ones that have been seen, uh, but until an official sighting is actually confirmed, it does look like this incredible creature is gone for good. That one's actually so sad. They were such a cool looking animal. Alright guys, there are thought to be almost 5,000 different species of frog in the world right now, but we've got one that recently went extinct. Number 7, the dodo bird. Remember these funny dudes from the movie Ice Age? Well, we wiped them out too. Pretty much. They were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the island of Meridius located in the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were gray and blue, they were beautiful, they didn't have any natural predator, all was going well until we came along. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors, and the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, we're not 100% to blame here. There was monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. So it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, and if it wasn't then, it would have been like a year later. Imagine dodo bird chicken wings now. That's all I'm saying, we're kind of the worst. Coming in at number seven now, we have the Tacopa pupfish. This tiny critter could only be found in two single hot springs in the Mojave Desert in California. They were trapped there when nearby lakes evaporated over the past 10,000 years and had lived there ever since. They were small, just over an inch or so in size, but were incredibly heat resistant. They could quite happily live in waters of up to 43 degrees Celsius or more. Sadly, being good with heat isn't everything when it comes to survival. Humans modified the area around them to build bathhouses at the springs and inadvertently introduced invasive fish species as well, leading to the Tacopa pupfish being declared extinct in the early 1970s. Number seven, the dodo bird. Speaking of the devil, this is we're definitely gonna eat these guys. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the island of Meritius, located in the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were big gray and blue, and they didn't have any natural predator, which is pretty sweet. They didn't have one until we came along. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and, well, the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either. We're not just 100% here to blame, you know? Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. So yeah, it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but can we bring back the dodo bird? Are we doing it? I think we're gonna do it. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart here. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring this bird back to life. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back an animal. Scientifically, that's a feat in itself, but do we really think nobody's gonna make dodo chicken wings? I'm just saying. 
That's just a problem waiting to happen. Coming in hot at number seven on this list is Homo Denisova. One of the more recent discoveries of an extinct human species was made in the Denisova cave in Siberia as recent as 2008. Only very few remains have been discovered so far, but thanks to advanced DNA analysis, it has been possible to sequence the genome of Homo Denisova. It has been possible to show that some people in Tibet have snippets of Denisovian DNA, the same way that some Europeans have tiny percentages of Neanderthal DNA. Coming in at number seven, we have Homo sapien ildeltu. This might be one of our closest known ancestors that has died off. This dude was walking around 160,000 years ago, and in terms of life on this planet, that's not that long ago. They would have walked upright, and it seemed that most of them lived in northern Africa. The remains of this ancestor were found in Ethiopia. It's unknown why this species wasn't able to make it into the future with us. One of the fossils discovered had the best preserved skull of any extinct human species. So we have been able to learn a lot about the size of this people's brain and their eating habits. The brain was pretty close to the same size as our own and it seemed like most of our ancestors it fed primarily on a vegetarian diet. Number seven, the ground sloth. Somebody warn Kristen Bell because I don't know if she will actually be able to handle this. The ground sloth was a massive version of the sloths we know now that existed around 8,000 years ago. Imagine a sloth combined with a giant bear. <laughs> So nice. They make the de-extinction list only because we do have DNA samples that have been extracted from a preserved strand of hair. So it could be done. The biggest problem preventing this, however, is the fact that no surviving relatives are large enough to give birth to it. But what scientists may be able to do is grow one in an artificial womb, which scientists in the Netherlands say they are within 10 years of perfecting. In our seventh spot today, we have the horned marsupial frogs. These little guys are so freaking cute. Like, just look at them. They have like weird pointy eyeball horns. But its eye horns aren't the only thing that makes this frog pretty weird. Its eggs develop in a pouch on the female's back. And when they hatch, you got fully formed frogs instead of tadpoles. That's pretty unusual for frogs. Anyways, these frogs live in the tropical rainforest in Ecuador. But due to habitat loss from oil palm crops, timber and mining, the frogs went extinct around 2005. They were declared extinct for 13 years until 2018 when they made a comeback. Since extinction, they now have a population of 350 with 18 new species. Number six, Chinese paddlefish. The Chinese paddlefish was one of the largest freshwater fish in the world, commonly measuring around three meters or nine and a half feet long. These fish were native to the Yangtze and Yellow River basins in China. It was one of just two in the paddlefish family, so pretty rare. Since the 1900s, this fish has been listed on the critically endangered list, with the two main culprits, of course, being, well, us, overfishing and habitat fragmentation. Unfortunately, in December 2019, because of several surveys that failed to locate any presence of this species, it has since been declared extinct. I hope that somewhere out there, this little colony of paddlefish hiding just somewhere and we just can't find them. Keep hiding, don't let us find you. We'll just fuck it up again, probably. Sadly, it's believed that this fish went extinct somewhere between 2005 and 2010. And number six, it's the gastric brooding frog. These little guys are, or rather were, incredible. They lived in small areas in northeast Australia and were never found more than a few meters from a river. The females would actually swallow their own fertilized eggs because they could grow and survive in their stomach because the mother had the ability to switch off her stomach acid to stop herself from digesting the eggs. This fascinated scientists who wanted to study them and learn this whole trick for humans who had stomach ulcers. But somewhere along the line it seems these little frogs were hit by a devastating disease that completely wiped them out. In fact, the last known sighting of them was in 1981, and despite scientists looking for them ever since then, they've been unsuccessful, and the gastric brooding frog has been declared extinct. Okay, halfway through now, hopefully this is all a bit more educational than it is depressing. I know it's quite sad. At number six now, we have the Puyuli bird, also known as the black-faced honey creeper. The Puyuli bird was discovered in Hawaii for the very first time in 1973. One of the reasons it took so long to discover them was just how small the population was. In 1980, scientists estimated the population to be just 140 birds. With such small numbers, it seemed they really started to suffer from human development in Hawaii. They lost their territory, they were eaten by human introduced mammals such as cats, and died to new diseases. The last wild Puyuli bird was seen in 2004, and tissue samples were taken to potentially clone it back into existence in the future. Number six. 
Caterina pupfish. Not to be confused with the Catalina wine mixer, the Caterina pupfish was a species of fish that was first found in 1972 and was endemic to a spring located in Nuevo Leon, Mexico. The species of fish was seen to be rapidly declining in the 80s and 90s due to their habitat being disrupted by groundwater extraction. You know the phrase, leave some for the fishies? This is what they kind of meant. This led scientists to try and save them by bringing some into captivity, which sounds weird, but hear me out. It turned out to be more difficult than anticipated. In 1994, the fish ended up being extinct in the wild, so the only members of the species remaining were the ones brought back into captivity. Sadly, the last remaining male of the species passed away in 2014, which was when the species became officially extinct. Because you need, you got it. Number six, Pyrenean Ibex. The last Pyrenean Ibex was a female named Celia. A falling tree sadly killed her in 2000. She was a subspecies of the Spanish Ibex and the Pyrenean Ibex were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France, as her name hints towards. Back in the medieval ages though, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. So it wasn't just recently, it was way back, you know, because of, again, hi, we got hungry. They were all over the place and knights and swords and bows and armies to feed. They were hunted down, sadly. Disease spread by humans also played an important role in their demise during this time. The Pyrenean Ibex was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven minutes. So we actually did this one. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Lung complications are why the clone didn't last, but listen to what I just said. They made a clone. Seven minutes is a start. I think I could handle a clone of myself for seven minutes, and then after that, I'm tapping out. Coming in at number six, we're bringing you Pengu Man. He was made out of clay, and his mother beats him with a frying pan, while everyone in his life is extremely volatile. If you don't understand that reference, I feel very sorry for you. Another extinct human found in 2008 was Homo Cytungensis. If you can't say that name, just call him the catchier nickname, Pengu Man. I struggle with that every single time. Pengu Man's fossilized mandible was discovered by fishermen working near Pengu Islands, off the coast of Taiwan. It is extremely thick and has gigantic teeth, which puzzled scientists for several reasons. They were like, how did a creature that didn't have access to a high carb diet and squats get so thick? I'm just kidding on that one. They have been able to determine that it was the mandible of a previously unknown species and that it was probably very similar to Homo erectus, but larger. It has so far not been possible to date this fossil, so they are not sure when the species was alive, but finding this incredibly strange fossil with very little to compare it to, it is clear that it doesn't exist anymore. Thankfully. Coming in at number six, we have Kenwick Man. What makes the discovery of Kenwick Man so interesting is that he's not that old. Now, this means that he is most likely a direct descendant and not an extinct species, but I wanted to include him on the list because I thought it was super cool. Kenwick Man was found off the coast of the Kenwick River in Colombia and holds a lot of similarities to other Native American people. He has similar bone structure and it's thought that he could have very similar DNA as well. When he was found, some information about his death was very fascinating. He didn't die from a tiger attack or old age, he had a spear lodged in his hip. That's a good way to die. So that means competing tribes in the area were duking it out over rule of land way back then, before we were even drawing lines about which nations belong to which people. It really makes you think about how long we've been fighting for and how in some ways it's built into our DNA. Moving on to number six, we have the Takahi. The Takahi are flightless birds that are native to New Zealand. They honestly kind of look like peacocks without the big colorful feathers. It's because they have the same bluey, greeny colorway. In the 1890s, their population began to decline due to hunting, competition for food, predators, and habitat loss. By 1898, they were declared extinct. But then, 50 years later, a small group of them were discovered high in the Murchison Mountains. As of 2019, the population is 418. It is said to be growing at a rate of 10% per year, slowly but surely. In fact, the rediscovery of this bird inspired New Zealand's longest running endangered species program. It's been in the works for more than 70 years now, with plans to make sure that this animal or any other animal never becomes extinct again, as well as they help save endangered species. Number six, the stellar sea cow. When I say sea cow, you might imagine the slow and lovable manatee, and you're not entirely wrong. They kind of look like a cross between a manatee and a sea lion. The stellar sea cow is an extinct Sirenian marine mammal, which is in the same order as the manatee. It used to live in the North Pacific Ocean during the Pleistocene and Holocene 
epoch and was last discovered in 1741 by the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition, but disappeared by the end of the 18th century. Scientists estimate that climate changes as well as Paleolithic human hunting may have been the reason the numbers were already so low even before Europeans made the last strike. Like some others on this list, however, scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we may see these creatures again one day. But at number five now is the Eskimo curlew. Now these long beaked birds used to be seen flying in massive flocks from Alaska and Canada way down to Argentina and back again. There used to be millions of them that could be seen across North and South America, but with every migration they made, their numbers kept shrinking due to hunting and destroyed habitats. Hunting these birds was banned though in 1916, but after 1939, there were no more sightings of them in South America at at all, and the last official sighting in North America happened in 1962. There have been a few unconfirmed reports of them in the years since then, but many experts are saying don't hold your breath at all because the chances are there are now no more Eskimo curlews. Moving on to number five now, we have the Canarian oyster catcher. The Canary Islands off the coast of West Africa are home to many amazing species, and the oyster catcher used to be one of them. Now, as you guys might guess from its name, it ate oysters and other other shoreline creatures. It went extinct sometime before 1940 for a number of different reasons. Firstly, humans overfished its food source. It also got attacked by rats and cats. And finally, humans absolutely loved the taste of their eggs. Unfortunately, too many eggs were eaten. Number five, the Labrador duck. Long before we ate this bird to extinction, the Labrador duck was a rare sight to see. Also referred to as the pied duck or the skunk duck because of its coloring, we really don't know much about this guy to this day, behavior wise. We know that it liked to hang out in sheltered bays, harbors in New Jersey, Long Island, New England, and of course, coastal Labrador. Did it honk or did it beep? That's a deep joke right there. The honk and the beep, different words for different places. You get it. The Labrador duck went extinct in the 1870s and it's because we believe we ate it to death. The bird was known to taste bad, but it was pretty cheap for meat in the market, so you get it, Bob's your uncle. Long before duck hunt, these birds were also hunted either for eggs, feathers, or just for fun. Another reason they went extinct is because we stole their lunch. The ducks were often in competition with us over their main food source, mollusks. The last known specimen was shot in New York. Yeah, shot like a mob boss. What a sad way for a species to go out. Number five, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, it was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s. Major factors here, as you guessed, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. It was sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back. So we're like, ah, oh, but maybe, maybe. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? Specimens still remain preserved in jars. Thank God for those jars. About time we open those things up, right? All those jar guys are like, hmm, finally, pull this one out. Already we have some of the Tasmanian tiger genes present after scientists inserted them into a mouse fetus. The Australian Museum has been working hard to bring this beast back to life. They're only still lacking the DNA to fully recreate it. So if you have any jars of Tasmanian tiger parts, you know, help us out, hit those thumbs. And for number five, we are at Menisi Man. Homo georgicus, otherwise known as Menisi Man, is a species of extinct human which has been found in Menisi, Georgia. The species has a very small brain, unlike many of our extinct ancestors. The five skulls, which are evidence of Homo georgicus, were discovered in 1991, and since then they've been subject to much debate. They may have been an intermediary between Homo erectus and Homo habilis, but there are some scientists who think their skulls are simply examples of Homo Homo erectus. Despite having small brains, the fossils are associated with a total of 73 tools, which proves that a large brain is not always necessary to use tools. Although I would not want to be around the dude who has a small brain and a bunch of tools. He's either going to do a terrible job fixing your car, or he's going to be rooting around your insides before you have the chance to introduce yourself. Coming in number five of Audrolopithecus ramidus. These guys play a very important role in understanding where we come from. Better known as Arty, these are some of the oldest known fossils that can be related to humans. This dude was most likely still covered head to toe in hair like a chimp. Now we would think that is super gross, but back then it was quite stylish. You were warm and comfy all the time. It was like having a free Snuggie. They walked the earth about 4.5 million years ago in Northern Africa. It's thought that the largest grouping of them would be in present day Ethiopia. Now, why is Artie so important to knowing more about our genome? Well, because Artie was around at a pivotal moment in our development. 4.5 million years ago was when we were going through a transfer period, when we were going from walking around like an ape to sometimes on two legs. The question is, 
why did we change? We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Tarsier. These are one of the cutest animals to ever exist. Just look at it. It looks like a cute little weird monkey squirrel alien thing. Like I want one as a pet. Anyways, this interesting creature is considered a nocturnal primate, but scientists still don't know much about it. One of the reasons being is that scientists thought that they went extinct in the 1920s. But in May of 2000, while checking a rat trap that they had set up in a forest, scientists discovered that they had actually accidentally caught a tarsier. Sadly though, this little dude was dead. But still, they were like, oh shoot, these creatures are back. Then in 2008, researchers found a family of them in Lor Lindu National Park. Nowadays, it's believed that there are only 5,000 to 10,000 of these animals in the whole world. And that number is sadly falling again instead of rising. It's because these little creatures don't live too long in captivity. In fact, when they are in distress, they apparently try and take their own lives. So that's a reason why it's hard to look after these little guys and keep them off of the endangered list. Number five, Elephant Shrew. It may surprise you to know that though a lot of big awful things might have happened, some good did come out of 2020. The Elephant Shrew is just one tiny but apparently mighty example. For just over 50 years, not a single Elephant Shrew had been spotted, which led scientists to believe that sadly this little long-nosed mouse was a lost species. Since the 1970s, any information derived from the species was found through examples examinations of historic specimens. But in August 2020, a team of researchers and academics reported the opposite, that they were indeed alive and apparently well. Somehow, these little creatures were able to rebuild their numbers and are now thriving across the Horn of Africa once again. Number five, Western Black Rhinoceros. The Western Black Rhino was a subspecies of the Black Rhinoceros and they made their home in the savanna of the Sub-Saharan Africa. These beautiful beasts were sadly the victims of poaching. That was the main cause that led into their rapid decline. People got so greedy trying to kill these incredible, beautiful animals so they could make money, and now they can't make any money off them because they killed them all. Nailed it, great plan, you know, you played yourself. You really did. This species first originated around seven to eight million years ago, and for most of the 1900s, it was the highest population of rhino species, believe it or not. That all changed, of course, in the 70s, because of course, that's when the population of black rhinos in general started to decrease. But besides poachers, another cause for the decline was farmers who killed these animals in order to protect their crops that were placed close to rhino territories. The last sighting of a western black rhinoceros was in 2006 in Cameroon's northern province, and sadly the subspecies was officially declared extinct in 2011. And for our number four now, we have the Baiji dolphin. Now unlike its oceanic cousin, this animal could only be found in Asia's longest river, the Yangtze River. This unique dolphin first appeared in the fossil records about 25 million years ago. There they survived for millions and millions of years, using echolocation to hunt for fish. Local fishermen even called the Baiji the goddess of protection, but it was a familiar story when humans began to disrupt its habitat. These days, an estimated 12% of the entire human population lives just along this river. Over the past 50 years, China's growth has meant more fishing, more ships, more pollution, and more dolphin hunting. In the 1950s, there were thought to be about 6,000 Baiji dolphins. By 1998, scientists could only find seven. In 2006, they looked again and found none at all, eventually declaring them to be extinct. Okay, coming on number four now, we have the Round Island Burrowing Boa. As its name suggests, this snake loved to burrow down into the soil on its tiny home of Round Island, just off the coast of Mauritius. It grew up to one meter in length, was light brown with black spots, and had a pointed snout. It was thought to have eaten lizards, but suffered habitat loss by soil erosion due to overgrazing there by goats and rabbits. It was last seen in 1975. You see, sometimes it's not just humans who make things go extinct. Goats so kind of to blame as well, not really. Number four, bulldog rat. I'll be honest, I'm kind of glad the bulldog rat is no longer a thing. It's disgusting, I don't like rats, sorry. Check this unit out. Known to be even larger than black rats, <laughs> The bulldog rat was last seen around 1903. The same time, speed walking was introduced to the Olympics. Coincidence? Completely, absolutely. They have two to three centimeters of fat on their backs, so gross, with short tails and thick hair. Yeah, a rat with thick hair. Not a fan. 
Again, sorry if you're a rat person. I can't even look at these things. I didn't include any images when I was writing this. Despite this thing not sounding holly and or jolly, its home was that of Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean. Sailors were responsible for this extinction. They pulled up to the island, Christmas Island, and brought with them no gifts but black rats riddled with disease. Yeah, it took less than a year to wipe out an entire rat species. Hashtag rats with fat. Number four, the great auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow to 30 inches long and its tiny wings would be only used to swim. Had little tiny, little wings. The wings were much smaller. They were about 13 centimeters long. Little flappy arms. No wonder they couldn't fly. Look at these things. Oh my God. They were cute, but obviously they were quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting. And it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out. Newfoundland looked like the iceberg from Club Penguin. And then we just rolled in and we're like, ho, 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 we are so hungry. It was packed, so they rapidly declined. And by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on LD Island, just off the coast of Iceland. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs. Remember those jars of organs always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA in the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed auk. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, and I'm hoping they pull through. Coming in at number four, we have the Red Deer Cave People, the most recently known archaic human to go extinct. The remains of the Red Deer Cave People have been dated approximately 11,500 years ago, meaning they were still around about 28,500 years after the last pure Neanderthal. Some scientists think the Red Deer Cave People were a hybrid of Homo Denisova and modern humans, but attempts to sequence their DNA have not proved successful, so it's currently impossible to say for sure. And at number four, we have Paranthorpus boyasi. Now let's get a little closer to the modern age. Not that close though. This long lost ancestor was around 1.4 million years ago and was found throughout Northern Africa. It's thought that they could have been one of the most dominant versions of humanoid for nearly 1 million years. That's not that bad of a track record. Hopefully we can pull off something similar. Something quite interesting about this ancestor is the mouth, jaw, and teeth because they were freaking huge compared to a lot of other primates of that time. It's thought that they had a high fat diet that consisted of nuts and hard shells. That is how they got the nickname Nutcracker. This species would use its strong jaws to crack open nut cases that other creatures couldn't get to. Being able to get to high calorie foods might be why this ancestor was able to be so dominant for so long. In our fourth spot today, we have the Golden Lion Tamarin. But I like to call it the Golden Majestic Monkey. Like, look at this thing! Look at its luscious locks! It's got nicer hair than me! Anyways, this orange primate is located in Brazil's Atlantic Forest. But sadly, with this habitat being destroyed, the population is at great risk. In the early 1970s, so few of them were alive in the wild that they were declared extinct. But with the help from the World Wildlife Federation, public charities, and 150 zoos, Brazil's government has been able to help these monkeys. There's now a healthy population of them being looked after by zoos all over the world. Plus, they have already breeded and reintroduced around 1,700 of these majestic guys back into the wild. It's sad, but the main threat these guys face is urbanization of the area. They're losing space to call home, and that's what's putting them at risk the most. Number four, the woolly mammoth. Since the film Ice Age came out, I'm sure a lot of us can't picture the animal without imagining like Ray Romano's voice along with it, because that's what we do. But eventually, we may not have to use only our imaginations to see real life woolly mammoths. Mammoths preserved in the permafrost in Siberia have given paleogeneticists enough data that they have been able to sequence the woolly mammoth genome, which we already know is super important. With this data, they may be able to clone the creature or edit the genetic material to its closest living relative, the Asian elephant. But it gets even cooler than that. In 2019, scientists from Japan and Russia announced a significant step towards this goal. They were able able to bring cells of the woolly mammoth back to life. They were able to recover cells from the hind leg of a juvenile mammoth they found in Siberia that was uncovered in 2011. They successfully implanted 28,000 year old cell nuclei into mouse cells. So though we may be very far off from actually seeing a mammoth, the kind of technology that's being developed here is astounding. Like it's so cool. Scientists hope that they can use this technology to help prevent whole species from disappearing forever. Bringing back the woolly mammoth has a lot of scientific and ethical boundaries that need to be addressed. For instance, there's social creatures, you'd need to bring back a whole herd. How would you introduce them back into the wild? Yada, yada, yada. But how cool is it that extinction in the future may rarely happen again if we can master this technology? Number four, the splendid poison frog. 
perfectly splendid. Mm. The splendid poison frog is a species of poison dart frog that was once abundant and thriving and could often be found in western Panama. Researchers believe that a chytrid fungus outbreak in their habitat led to a rapid decline of the species. In fact, this fungus is responsible for the death of a mass amount of amphibian species, as the number of amphibians has been dropping at an alarming rate in the last few decades. We can also do a list on that. Depressing. Because of this, they were basically a species of frog that was once an extremely popular pet. It is thought that there might be unknown specimens which are still alive in captivity, but unfortunately none have been found in the wild, and there aren't any currently that exist in zoos or research collections. The last time one of these frogs was recorded was in 1992. Their fungus outbreak occurred in 1996, and as of 2020, they have been listed as an extinct species. Next up at number three, we have the Pinta Island tortoise. Now on the Galapagos Islands, there are many, many different species of giant tortoises. Each one is unique to each one of the islands. One of them was the Pinta Island tortoise. Thanks to tortoise hunting and the introduction of feral goats, which destroyed the island's vegetation, the Pinta Island tortoises were thought to be completely completely wiped out by the mid 20th century. Then, on November the 1st, 1971, a scientist spotted Lonesome George, the last surviving member of his species. Scientists kept looking, but it really looked like he was actually the last of his kind. They tried mating him with a closely related subspecies, but all the eggs were sterile. Lonesome George died on June 24th, 2012, at the grand old age of, well, Nobody's really quite sure, but some people say he was a hundred. Scientists are still on the lookout for another Pinta Island tortoise, but it's looking increasingly likely that George was the very last one. All right guys, next up at number three now, we have the Mexican grizzly bear. You guys might picture grizzly bears living in the American mountains or Canadian wilderness, but for a long time, they had cousins in Mexico. They reached up to six feet tall and could weigh over 700 pounds. Now, for the most part, the bears and the humans avoided each other in this area, but when bears started killing cattle, the farmers considered them a pest and encouraged people to hunt them. Hunting them was banned, but by 1950, only 30 of them were left. The hunting continued, and the last one was thought to have been sighted in 1964. Number three, Pyrenean Ibex. The horns on this thing, are you kidding? What have we done? The Pyrenean Ibex went extinct around 2000. They said the world was going to end, and for these guys, it did. A subspecies of the Spanish ibex, the Pyrenean ibex were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France. See, back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. They were all over, but you know, knights and swords and bows and people were hungry, they obviously didn't last long. That and disease spread by humans, that also played an important role in their demise. But here's the craziest part and the main reason I wanted this guy on our list. They tried to clone one back in 2003. It failed, obviously, but a cloned extinct animal. Hmm, sounds familiar. Number three, the moa. This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago. Moa were these flightless birds, massive, might I add, and archaeologists first discovered its fossil in a cave. Its flesh and everything was still attached. That's the gross part. These ancient birds would reach about five feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think that's quite petite in comparison. These birds stopped flying right after the dinosaurs went extinct. Interesting timing. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University in Canberra, these birds safely roamed the land after they didn't need to make these daring dino escapes in the sky. They walked around, got fat, and would hang out in caves. Honestly, pretty ideal. Phillips says this is an advantage when it comes to birds and evolution because wings, be it big or small, kill energy. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating good, they're comfortable now. Scientists have now found more moa DNA from ancient eggshells, so it's possible that we may see these fatties throw the skies once again. We're finally down to the top three here of the most amazing top 10 list of scary extinct human species, and now we have Homo naledi. Evidence of Homo naledi was unearthed in 2013 in a cave in South Africa by cavers who were able to access a chamber in the Rising Star cave system for the very first time. 30 meters down or 98 feet below the surface, it's strewn with thousands of bones which have unique and interesting features, with 1,550 currently excavated and many more remaining in the cave. Some of their features are archaic and resembling specimens from 20 million years ago, but they also have more modern hominid features and their bones have been dated about 250,000 years ago. It has been concluded that they are not direct ancestors of 
of modern humans. Thrippus chidensis. Now we are going back in time. This species is a common ancestor for both chimpanzees and humans. It's estimated that this beast walked the earth about 7 million years ago, and it was at this point where our two species split. It would have been two separate groups of primates breaking off that made our two separate species. I think we got the better deal out of this split. Now why did our species do so much better than chimpanzees? Well, it could have been nutrition or crossbreeding with other ancient species, but the story is still yet to be told. Number three, the gastric brooding frog. The cooler name of this amphibian is the Rio Batrachis, which were a kind of ground dwelling frog native to Queensland, Australia. It was one of two known frog species that was capable okay, of incubating their offspring within their stomach of the mother. She would swallow her own eggs, her stomach would stop making hydrochloric acid to avoid digestion, and transform her stomach into a womb, essentially. When the anywhere from 20 to 25 tadpoles hatched, the mucus from their gills kept the acid at bay, which was super exciting for scientists because then they could figure out how to do that in humans if they were able to study them. But unfortunately, these frogs disappeared almost as soon as they were discovered. Unfortunately, both species of this weird and wonderful genus became extinct around the mid 1980s, but, but the scientists, a part of the appropriately named Lazarus Project, planned to bring it back to life. Previous cell samples of the species collected prior to the 1970s have been preserved for 40 years in a conventional freezer. In 2013, Professor Mike Archer and his colleagues announced they were able to successfully grow early stage cloned embryos containing DNA from the gastric brooding frog. Though it's taking longer than a couple years, the Lazarus Project is still on track to bring this unique creature back to life. But it's also important to know that frogs across the world are dying from the deadly chytrid fungus, and this technology could save them all. Moving on to number three, we have Catagonus wagneri. Now, these animals are weird because just look at them. They look like gray hairy pigs or warthogs, but you know, without the little horns. Either way, I still find them cute. Back in the day, this creature was discovered from early fossil records. Then in 1974, a biology professor from University of Connecticut was on a National Geographic research expedition when he rediscovered these creatures and they are no longer considered endangered or extinct. A huge population of them live in a 2,400 acre area in Grand Chaco. They hide out in the bushy thorny areas so that they are safe from jaguars and pumas and local hunters. Another huge population resides in the Tagua Sanctuary at the CCCI Conservation Center. Number three, the Morian viviparis tree snail. The Morian viviparis, sounds like a Harry Potter spell. This snail was a species of air breathing tropical land snails that were endemic to French Polynesia. The African land snail was introduced into Tahiti in 1967 as a food source, but it quickly escaped and began to destroy crops. Biologists then attempted to control the African land snail population, so they decided to introduce the rosy wolf snail to the area in 1977. Well, this went to believe it or not, although they're snails, it gets pretty aggressive. These snails have beef. The rosy wolf snail didn't just control the population of African land snails, but rather they started to eradicate all of the snails that were native to the area, which of course includes our little Morian viviparis man. So this next little introduction led them to becoming totally extinct in the wild. Keyword here, wild. These snails still exist in captivity and there have been attempts to re-release them into the wild, but the rosy wolf snail is just sitting out there waiting for them, so they can't release them. They figure it's just gonna be a dead end. Imagine that, just nine snails waiting outside of a lab, like. So at this point, it looks like they will never be able to return to the wild, which is super sad. It also sucks that the intention really was to help these things, but it just didn't work. At least we tried this time. Okay, coming in at number two now, we have the Eastern Cougar. Now these days, if you are lucky enough in your life to see a cougar in North America, it's probably not going to be the Eastern Cougar variety. They once roamed large parts of Northeastern America up into Canada and hunted white-tailed deer. As American settlements grew in the 1800s, they came into contact with the Eastern Cougar and a fight to the death began. You get no prizes for guessing who won that one. The Eastern Cougars struggled on for about another 100 years Years. One was spotted and killed in Canada in 1932, and then another in Maine in 1938, and then nothing. They were added to the endangered list in 1973, and then in 2011, 73 years after their last sighting, the Eastern Cougar was officially declared extinct. Alright, moving on to number two now, we have the Bulldog Rat. Look 
at this chubby little thing. Some people found it cute, other people found it kind of scary. Either way, it used to thrive on Christmas Island, thousand miles off the coast of Australia. It wasn't the actual size of a bulldog, but it was bigger than the rats we know today, coming in at a whopping 17 inches in size. They lived almost alone on that island for thousands of years with no known predators. It became extinct at the start of the 20th century, presumably from diseases carried there by European rats on ships. Number two, the woolly mammoth. Believe it or not, scientists are trying to bring this one back from extinction. Yeah, it was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal are planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. The last mammoth alive was around 7,500 years ago, right at the end of the last ice age. They want to put them back on the map. Literally, they want to put them back in the Siberian tundra. Thousands of years ago, it was once full of these hairy behemoths, but climate change slowed them down a bunch. Humans also didn't help. They needed food, and these guys provided warmth and, well, look at them. Lots of food. I can't wait until science brings back the woolly mammoth, and then in like 50 years, they get to go extinct all over again. Like, let's just learn from mistakes. I don't know. Number two, Megatherium. AKA giant ground sloths. That's a bit of a nicer name. Yeah, sloths, let's bring those back. Wait, they're already here. Hmm, I'm confused, Taylor. Sloths used to be a lot bigger than we think. We often look at them now for being so slow and silly. The movie Ice Age or Zootopia, they sure didn't help their case. Now, of course, the giant ground sloth is closely related to our modern three-toed sloth, but luckily for us, today's sloths aren't that big. They're not the same size as an elephant, which is pretty sweet. That would be a horror film. If a giant elephant-sized sloth started to climb that tree, slowly, might I add, ugh, I'd be sick. We may be able to bring this one back, although they died off 8,000 years ago. DNA samples were extracted from their hair remains, so the next step now is to develop a fetus in an artificial womb. That's the hard part. That's where science and technology might just do the rest. But as of right now, we just we've got a pile of hair. We're like, maybe. Coming in at number two on the list, we have The Hobbit. In 2004, researchers made an announcement that a discovery had been made on the island of Flores, Indonesia. The people on the island had long talked about Ubu Gogo, a race of short-haired, hairy men who lived in the caves. Astonishingly, the discovery of stone tools and the remains of a small hominid in the cave on the island seemed to prove the legend right. The official name was Homo floresiensis, after the island, but they have become known as The Hobbit. Homo floresiensis was approximately 3.5 feet tall with large feet. The Hobbit had very primitive features and a small brain, like our earliest Australopithecan ancestors, but they were able to use tools and also may have been able to hunt and use fire. Using fire back then must have made you the biggest bad of all time. You could just wave it around and everyone would have thought you were a god, and they would have for sure thought you could just like dance really cool or something like that that would go along with the fire. Coming at number two is Australopithecus Garhi. All right, we're nearly at number one, and this guy has locked down the number two spot because A, Garhi was the first known pre-homo species to use stone tools. That's absolutely incredible. It's thought that they were not primarily used for hunting or combat, but mostly for butchering meat that had already been killed. They most likely walked the earth 2.5 million years ago. They had huge jaws and heads, but brains that weren't much larger than any other Australopithecus that could have existed around that time. It seems that the females of these species were quite large, which could mean that the males and females were the same size. In our second spot today, we have the Tasmanian Devil. Not the dude from Looney Tunes. Don't worry, he's still being animated and he is wild. Anyways, the Tasmanian Devil used to be found all over the place, but now they are only found on the island state of Tasmania. Around 3,000 years ago, these creatures went extinct because of predation. They were being hunted by the dingo. And then they were hit by the devil facial tumor disease, which is a contagious form of cancer. This spread like wildfire and killed 90% of the population. As a result, they were declared extinct. But over the years, the creatures were reintroduced to wildlife sanctuaries and have been introduced in New South Wales in Australia. This has helped save the population. Plus, the population is thriving in Tasmania, as there are no dingoes there to hurt them. Number two, the quagga. So they actually have brought this back, kind of. The quagga was a type of zebra that used to roam South Africa in herds before European settlers killed them all. But now scientists in Cape Town figured out how to bring them back. Quaggas had stripes very similar to zebras, but they only appeared on the front half of their bodies and are brown along the rear. Eric Harley, the project's leader, discovered that the key to bringing back this animal was through genetics, of course, as we, we know now. By testing quagga skins, they discovered that they were actually a subspecies of the zebras we know and love. Therefore, it could be possible to manifest the genes through selective breeding and 
they were right. They are now in the fifth generation of the breeding process and already there are less and less stripes and the appearance of a brown color. The next step would be to see if they can exact the pattern and behavioral differences between the quagga and zebras, not just the coloring. So they still got a long way to go, but really cool. Number two, Bramble K. Malamis. These little rodents were a species that was endemic to the isolated Bramble K, which is a vegetated coral K located at the northern tip of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. The last sighting of these cute little dudes was in 2009, and in May of 2015, they were declared extinct by the IUCN and then by the Australian government later in 2019. So it's official in many ways. The Queensland state government has cited this as the first mammal extinction due to climate change. That's because their extinction was driven by the K's disappearing vegetation, which was due to rising sea levels. And to even further this, scientists also indicated that storm surges did not help as it would have inevitably led some of these animals into the species, you know, death. They, they would drown. One interesting thing about this species though, the scientists figured out, and they're not really sure how it got to the K in the first place, but it's believed that perhaps they may have floated over on driftwood, which sounds so cute and funny. That's like a Disney Pixar adventure in the making right there. Imagine these dudes just floating by you. My heart. And finally at number one, we have the Western Black Rhino. Now these majestic animals were cousins of the white rhino that you guys might recognize, but they'd always struggle to survive compared to them. It's thought that from 1965 to 1995, about 98% of black rhinos were killed by poachers. They wanted the black rhino horns to sell to Chinese medicine dealers who claim that the horns can cure pretty much every illness under the sun. Spoiler alert, they can't. Now, despite conservationists trying to tell people this, the demand for black rhino horns stayed high, so poachers kept poaching. In 1900, there were thought to be one million of these rhinos. By 1997, guess how many were left? Ten. The last one was actually spotted in 2001, and after 10 years of no sightings, the western black rhino was declared extinct in 2011. And finally at number one now, we have the Falkland Islands wolf. Their home was the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic, where it was the only native land mammal there. They were not scared of humans at all, but humans saw them as a threat to their sheep. They were easily lured to people by simply holding out a piece of meat, and they were then killed. The Falkland Islands wolf didn't learn to not be trusting of humans and became officially extinct in 1876. And finally coming in at number one, the northern white rhinoceros. We had the western black rhinoceros in part one, so we might as well finish on the sad reality that is the 2018 extinction of the northern white rhino. There are no more males left. The last male passed away in 2018, so this is just a lost cause really when it comes to saving these guys. On top of that, in recent news, one of the two remaining female rhinos is being retired from the international breeding program put into place. Her name is Najin, she's 32 years old, and she lives in a Kenyan nature preserve with her daughter Fatu. Now, both Najin or her daughter are able to carry a rhino calf. Their only hope, really, before this was to collect the rhino's eggs, send them to a lab, and then they extracted sperm from the two deceased males, and scientists were hoping to implant them into a surrogate mother from the southern white rhino population. The group running the operation, BioRescue, spoke out recently. The head veterinarians Frank Goritz and Stephen Gulu said, Retiring one individual from a conservation program because of animal welfare considerations is usually not a question to think about for long. But when one individual is 50% of your entire population, you consider this decision several times. Yeah, 32 years old, more than fair. This isn't on her or her daughter. It's on poachers, probably. Cheers. And finally, number one, the gastric brooding frog. I'm a big fan of frogs and toads, all that stuff. Except for when they hatch eggs out of their back. That's arguably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. We'll maybe show you after, maybe, I don't know. These gastric brooding frogs would swallow their eggs and then hatch them out of their mouth. So if you watch them give birth in reverse, it would be pretty confusing. That would be a horror film. They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have figured out how to implant these dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Let's just hope these new ones aren't born out of your back. And the moment you've all been waiting for, we are at number one on our list. And for number one, we have the Ghost Ancestor. A study published in 2019 has shared evidence of yet an undiscovered extinct human ancestor proposed after an AI program determined that there was a ghost population of archaic humans which interbred with modern humans in the distant past. Researchers think the unknown ancestor may have been an offshoot of Homo Denisova based on the evidence. With new techniques such as this and advances in fields such as DNA analysis, 
is now possible to learn more about extinct species of human than ever before. New species are being discovered and identified with relative frequency, and the earliest discoveries can now be reassessed and analyzed with greater detail. The evidence is pointing not to one unbroken chain of human ancestors, but a rich family tree and a number of offshoots. Exactly how many extinct relatives we have will we will probably never know for sure, but with each discovery we are able to add new unique pieces to the puzzle of who we are. But wait, that's not all that we have for you on today's top 10 list guys. People living today who are in Europe, Asia, and Eurasia have well-defined Neanderthal-derived segments in their genome. These fragments are traces of interbreeding that followed the out-of-Africa human migration dating about 60,000 years ago. They imply that children born with Neanderthal modern human pairings outside of Africa were raised among the modern human and ultimately bred with other humans, explaining how bits of of Neanderthal DNA remain in the human genome. The plot thickens. Are previous human species embedded within us somehow? Did we evolve from so-called extinct species that I just presented you with? If you weren't scared listening before, then you might be a little bit scared right now. Coming in at number one is Australopithecus afarensis. Probably one of the best studied ancestors. The key to unlocking more knowledge about these dead species is fossils, and A. afarensis is one of the species that we have the most fossils of. Through modern discoveries, we have been able to determine that these males were much larger than the females, and there was most likely a constant battle for dominance between males. They competed for land and mates. The females most likely gathered foods for their prehistoric tribes. It's fascinating what we have been able to discover, and when I say we, I mean people much smarter than me who can pronounce big science words. I'm just the messenger who read a few things on the internet. Number one, the Pyrian Ebex. So technically, this is the only species to ever go extinct twice. The Pyrian Ebex, or Bacardo, became extinct back in 2000 when a fallen tree fell on on the last female Celia. Sad way to go. But scientists were quick to freeze some of the cells in liquid nitrogen. With these cells, they were able to clone a calf in 2003 that was brought to life for only a few minutes before it died. Despite the loss, it was a historic event in history and the first de-extinction. Now they still plan to use the 14-year-old cells of Celia, but first they must see if they are still alive. In addition to this, they are also attempting to clone embryos and implant them in female goats. So they did it once. Who is to say they won't be able to do it again? But maybe, maybe with bigger prey. And in our number one spot today, we have the Silocan. The Silocan, which is spelled nothing like it's pronounced, I thought it would be like Koala Camp. <laughs> but no, I guess not. Anyways, these dudes have the most famous comeback story of all time. These fish were said to have been around when the dinosaurs were alive. That's right, that's how old these dudes are. In the 19th century, that's when scientists discovered a fossil of this fish. The fossils were said to be over 410 million years old. It's said that they went extinct around 66 million years ago. That was until 1938 when they were rediscovered off the coast of South Africa. That has to be the greatest comeback of all time. They still are critically endangered, but the fact that they managed to survive millions of years is absolutely insane. And finally, number one, the Spix Macaw. If you've recently watched the 2011 hit animated film Rio, this one should ring a bell. These guys once painted the skies in Brazil. They're absolutely beautiful. They're a medium sized parrot weighing around 11 ounces, but unfortunately, 2016 was the last time they were found in the wild. Illegal pet trade is believed to have played a significant role in the decline of their numbers. Deforestation and their need for a specialized habitat also didn't make it easy for them. While there are currently around 100 of these macaws still left in captivity, there are none in the wild, which is the biggest problem here. Scientists and animal specialists continue to do their best to keep the species alive through the process of captive breeding, and their hope is to one day, one day be able to reintroduce them to the wild, effectively reversing their extinction in the world. It doesn't happen very often that we get a chance to reverse an animal extinction, so I figured we'd end this list off with a little bit of hope. Nice, we love it.